Okay, so um, before we get into today's lecture, I want to talk about uh, the Lab 3 formal report a little bit. Uh, if you take a look at uh, the video that I made yesterday, and I talked about a little bit, I think I actually have this exact same slide in there. I mentioned I'm going to talk a little bit about the lab reports, uh, uh, just a little bit at the beginning of every, every lecture. Um, so starting on Monday, for example, I'll talk a little bit about introduction to methods, and then I'll talk a little bit about results on Wednesday, and a little bit about discussion on Friday, and so on. Uh, just so you guys get a little bit of time to kind of think about each section independently. As I mentioned in the video, it is really important that you do not try to attempt to do this all in one night. Uh, you will not be very successful in that. Um, it's very important you work a little bit on it here and there, and it's uh, worth a significant amount of your, your grade, so it's important that you do do well on this. I will do my best to get uh, the first reports back to you by next week. Uh, that is my goal is to get them back to you by Thursday uh, so they have a little bit of time to see my feedback and get an idea of, uh, of how I'm grading and uh, use that knowledge towards your, your lab three formal report. So if you're looking for a place to start, uh, I would start on the results, uh, make your graphs, uh, try to interpret and figure out you know, what it was that we were doing and, um, and then you can start uh, building the rest of the report around that. Uh, maybe work on your discussion questions a little bit. Uh, take a look at the lab manual and see what's expected of you in the introduction. This page here is giving you an idea of uh, how uh, long each of those sections are. Uh, probably the one that some people struggle with the most will be the methods. You can see I'm asking for half a page max. And I'm going to talk about that next week. You're not going to give me all the details of the methods. Uh, it's going to be very tight and concise. So a bit more on that. Uh, like I said, next week, I want to talk about a little bit of it uh, kind of each day. Uh, I recommend, like I said, you take a look at it, start working on your results section, uh, maybe start answering some of your discussion questions, and we'll tune back in next week, and I'm going to give you pointers for each of those areas. But do take a look at all the instructions that I gave you. I know it's a lot, uh, particularly if you've never written a lab report before. Uh, it can be quite a bit of information to absorb and quite a bit of information, uh, quite a bit of work. Um, by the time you graduate from your degree, you'll, you've written so many of these, you'll laugh at how uh, one, lab, one lab report is not a, a big deal, but it will be if it's your first one, for sure. So back to bacteria. Uh, here we are. Um, last day we were talking about different bacterial structures, and uh, we learned some new words, so hopefully you've been using them all in your day-to-day -day conversations. <laughs> uh, Anyway, we're going to continue and talk about some other bacterial structures and I have a Kahoot for you uh, in a couple of minutes here so you can load that app up if you're ready to go. Uh, we can do that as well. So one place that we finished off on last day is we were talking about the glycocalyx. So I'm going to actually write that word down here for you. So glycocalyx. So if you remember what that was, glyco means sugar and calyx means coat. So glycocalyx are sugar coats, and there were two types. We talked about the capsules and the slime layers, and uh, I had mentioned that they are, you know, kind of goopy and slimy because the carbohydrates absorb quite a bit of water, which makes them kind of sticky. So something that's kind of similar to glycocalyx uh, are these things called biofilms. So biofilms are really how bacteria, for the most part, grow in the wild. So they make all these secretions, which will include their glycocalyx, but there is often all sorts of other secretions, carbohydrates and glycoproteins and things like that, and it kind of forms a goo around them. And this is how they live. And why are they doing that? Because they want to stick to surfaces, and this is uh, kind of how they communicate with their neighbors as well. So if you've ever gone to a lake and you go swimming, and there's a slimy rock. Uh, that's a biofilm. Pretty much all slime is a biofilm of some sort. Uh, kind of a mat of, like I said, uh, the bacteria and, and the goop that they're living in. And uh, so it's, it's a worthwhile word uh, to know, and I'm gonna add it to our list of, uh, of bacterial structures here in a minute. I know I have some more slides of biofilms, so I wanna show you uh, some uh, medically relevant biofilms. So one biofilm that we all have is on our teeth right now. 
Uh, even if you've brushed really well, I guarantee you somewhere on your teeth, you have a biofilm of bacteria. Now, if you haven't brushed in a while, you probably know your teeth kind of feel, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, sometimes people use the word fuzzy. <laughs> um, but you can feel it on your teeth, right? Or if you've had a lot of sugar, sometimes you can, you can feel them growing on there. And those bacteria are growing on there. There's hundreds of species. And some of them produce acids. Uh, some of them produce gum disease. So, you know, this, this, is, uh, this is a biofilm. Uh, and like I said, brushing your teeth is going to kind of remove that mechanically and uh, hopefully help you in the long run. So, uh, same thing with flossing. Uh, you know, if you're going to discard one thing, the toothpaste or the toothbrush, uh, keep the toothbrush uh, because that is actually doing way more work than the toothpaste. Okay, so uh, I have a Kahoot for you. So you can load up the app and uh, ask you some questions. Um, although I just remembered I was going to make a note for you for biofilm. So let's do that first. So there's our notes from last day. I'm just continuing down here. So biofilm. And what is a biofilm made out of? It's made of carbohydrates and glycoproteins. So what is a biofilm doing? This is allowing it to attach to surfaces in the environment. So Kind of similar to glycocalyx. Again, it's even more goopy than a slime layer. In fact, sometimes people just call biofilm slime. So I have a couple more additions to this uh, uh, to this Word document, so I'll get back to it. Uh, and uh, so if you missed that, uh, we will get back to it. So load up your Kahoot, and we will play a short Kahoot on bacterial structures. Okay, give you about 20 more seconds to join. Okay, here we go. You can join in if you don't, uh, you can join in any time, of course. So bacterial structures. So this Kahoot is gonna use mostly the same diagram, by the way. Object one, so object one. Oh, sorry that the diagram is so small, but you have to identify what object one is. So object one is the nucleoid. Remember, bacteria do not have a nucleus, but they have something that we call the nucleoid region, which is basically just the chromosome, and it's in the cytoplasm. So scoreboard, looks like Rianne is in the lead. Let's see if she can hold on to it. Number two, so same picture, object number two. So object number two is uh, pointing to that uh, little projection uh, on the outside. It's kind of uh, looks like a little finger or a little hair. Okay, so object two is a pillus. So what was a pillus? A pillus was a proteinaceous, that means it's made out of protein. Um, a finger-like thing that is used to attach to surfaces. Scoreboard, mixing it up a little bit. Question three, object number four. So object number four is that thing on the end, on the left-hand side, that big long tail-like thing. Looks like I gave you too much time on that one. 
Number one, flagellum. Excellent. Well done. Almost everyone got that one correct. Okay. Next question. Number four. Object number five. So object number five, a little hard to tell what's going on with these uh, cell surface structures here, but it's kind of outside there. Uh, and it's, um, it's outside of the cell wall. So hopefully that gives you a clue as to what it might be. Okay, so it looks like a 50-50. People were stuck between uh, glycocalyx and phospholipid. And the correct answer is glycocalyx. So that's actually uh, on, uh, it's outside of the membrane, it's outside of the cell wall, uh, and it's kind of just a thick layer. I know it doesn't look very goopy, but that would be a capsule or a slime layer uh, in that diagram there. Okay, somebody is on fire, it looks like. Good job. Question five, object six is and object seven is. So take a careful look. Um, I kind of gave you some clues about what those are, so I'm not going to tell you what they are until we have a chance to see the answer. Okay, time is up, and the correct answer is the plasma membrane in the cell wall. It's a little bit hard to tell from the picture. I'm just going to zoom in on, on this, but uh, if you take a look here, uh, number seven I'm looking at is the uh, plasma membrane, and so that is separating the cell from its surroundings. The cell wall is outside of the cell membrane, and so those are the correct answers, plasma membrane and cell wall. Okay, let's see how the scores come out. Three bronze for Natalie. Silver for Shane. Well done, I think that's Aladdin. Good job. Yay! Hopefully you're having fun with these cahoots. They are kind of cool. Okay, so back to our PowerPoint here. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a few other uh, bacterial structures that I want to talk about. Uh, one of these structures are something called an endospore. So the word endo means inside. And you may have heard of the word spore before. Usually when people are talking about spores, they're actually talking about fungi, because fungi do produce something called actual spores. Um, endospores are something produced by bacteria. And you can see from the slide, it says they're produced when, when conditions get rough for the bacteria. So maybe they're under starvation, or maybe it's too dry. And so for a lot of environmental organisms, this is actually what they're experiencing on a, on a daily or seasonal basis in some cases, right? Imagine being in the soil, sometimes it rains, sometimes it doesn't for a few weeks. Uh, so what do, what do they do? They, uh, uh, they uh, and this is not all bacteria, by the way, you can see the note, it says gram positives only, uh, and not even all gram positives, only certain species of gram positives. So what do they do? They, they take their genome and they say, okay, we got to protect this thing. So they take their DNA, uh, they, they pack some chemicals in there, they kind of preserve it, uh, usually a little bit of ATP and some ribosomes, and they surround it with a thick layer of peptidoglycan. And there's actually a few other uh, polymers in there they surround it with, and, and they protect themselves. So if you take a look here on these slides, I'll show you some, some better images in a moment, but on these slides, there's an endospore stain, and you can see those little blue dots kind of inside, uh, inside those bacillus there. Uh, this one here is kind of cool. The endospores kind of get fat, and uh, they kind of look like little mini uh, spoons or tennis rackets. And uh, so I thought that one was kind of cool. So here's a, uh, here's a picture of, of some other ones, some electron micrographs and some different stains. Um, you may or may not have heard of endospores. This was a few years ago now, so 2001. So maybe some of you weren't even born then. Uh, but this was a significant um, historical event uh, when that was the year, of course, there were the, uh, the, the planes that, uh, uh, ran into the trade towers in New York, and there were some other uh, terrorism that happened that fall. And one of them was uh, somebody had sent into the mail uh, a bunch of endospores uh, from anthrax. And so some mail carriers had inhaled them, and, and some people got very sick, and some people died from it. And it was, a, 
it was uh, quite a uh, quite a scary time uh, to be a ma mail carrier because of course what was going on. Um, you can read about this on the internet. Uh, the prime suspect uh, committed suicide uh, and uh, was an American and, and they're not sure if they really understand the motivations behind this but uh, um, you know this was not uh, in fact the only time anthrax endospores were used uh, for terrorism purposes uh, and you can also read about the uh, Soviet a biological weapon program, which is very scary as well. Uh, so they're very tough, dormant things. You can send them the mail, they can survive being dried, and then they can re-germinate the endospores. Uh, there's another electron micrograph of one, and, and uh, you can see the nucleoid in the middle in that coat. That coat is just a bunch of peptidoglycan, uh, and it's kind of thicker than normal peptidoglycan. And often the, uh, the outermost part of this can be uh, kind of sloughed off and and the endospore sometimes just remains. So it's even smaller than a bacterial cell. So this is kind of just showing how they form. So you can see you have a vegetative cell and then rather than undergoing kind of a normal cell division, uh, it's asymmetrical. So they're just protecting one copy of their genome. So you can see uh, after that, they uh, uh, start engulfing their genome. They form a thick layer of peptidoglycan around the genome. And then in many cases, the, uh, the spore, endospore, uh, gets released from all of the rest of the material. So one question about these things is, is how resilient are they? Um, they can be sent through the mail, that's kind of scary. Uh, they can survive in the soil. Uh, and it turns out that, uh, you know, if you read the textbooks, they all say at least 50 years. So definitely longer than 50 years. We have all sorts of interesting examples of endospores that have been uh, recovered from unique situations. So Louis Pasteur, we were talking about him a couple of weeks ago, uh, 67 years after he died, they were cleaning out a, a storage room or something and they found a bunch of his samples. And from those samples, they were able to actually revive endospores. 67 years later. So I said at least 50 years. Um, what about longer? Well, it turns out there's been all sorts of uh, discoveries that seem to indicate endospores can actually last a lot longer. Um, there have been at least a couple of studies where, you know, we have these Egyptian mummies and they're three, in some cases, 4,000 years old. And, uh, you know, we wanna know about humans and what was going on back then. And so they can, you know, they'll actually drill in and take samples from the gut to see if they get an idea of what these, uh, what these people were eating at the time, for example. Some of the samples they took and they were able to culture bacteria from them, uh, which indicates that endospores seem to survive a long, long time. Uh, this one here, we're, we're pretty sure there's been a few studies that have kind of replicated this for, for endospores. Um, these last two studies uh, are kind of in that questionable, maybe, maybe not stage where there's uh, definitely skeptics and doubters. Um, and that's okay, but, uh, and there's a couple of reasons for this. You can see we're talking about these ice cores from Antarctica and people claiming to have revived endospores from there. One of the big reasons why we're kind of doubting this is that uh, we're not actually sure if DNA as a chemical can last more than about 50,000 or 100,000 years. Uh, in terms of kind of, you know, some of the chemistry around the molecule, there's a debate around that. Of course, the believers are saying, hey, uh, but endospores have special chemicals in them that preserve DNA and, and uh, things like that. So maybe these can last. I'll show you one more uh, that I read about years ago. Um, you may have uh, seen this concept before, or maybe you've uh, seen this little movie or read the book called Jurassic Park. And the whole concept behind Jurassic Park was that uh, we have these insects preserved in amber and the insects, uh, maybe the insect had you know, bitten a dinosaur. And, and so the concept behind Jurassic Park is that the dinosaur blood was from these insect guts was used to clone and make dinosaurs, right? Uh, actually, this is where the idea came from, uh, where there is a researcher in uh, the States who had uh, claimed to have extracted uh, endospores from the guts of these insects and revive them and, and, and grow them in the lab. And again, like I said, there's some, some doubters, but uh, at least 50 years, probably a lot longer. Okay, so let's make a note about endospores. I think this might be the last one I'm adding to the list, this list, I can't quite recall, uh, but I'm gonna write it down. So what are endospores made of? Let's say a thick 
flare of peptidoglycan. So endospores are formed when some bacteria experience, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, unfavorable conditions. My spell checker doesn't like the Canadian spelling of unfavorable. That's okay, we're gonna keep it. Uh, so we'll say starvation or drought are kind of the big ones. And um, maybe that's, that's good enough. Um, maybe I'll say one more point. Uh, these are dormant structures. So you may have noticed the other term we're using was vegetative. Vegetative means growing when we're talking about bacteria. Uh, and dormant means, of course, kind of like sleeping. It's, uh, uh, you know, and, and not growing and metabolizing, so not using energy at all. Okay, so back to the PowerPoint. There are other things to say about bacteria, and we're going to say a little bit about them uh, next week in the lab as well. We, uh, one thing to think about bacteria, of course, is, as we've talked about already, is they have shapes. So here's a shape we talked about already. We talked about the cocci. Uh, these are the spherical shapes. Uh, and there's a couple other on, others on here that uh, we're going to look at uh, bacteria that have these shapes uh, in ne for next week's lab exercise. So you can see the second one here is rod-shaped or bacilli. Bacilli is plural. So for one, we would say bacillus like this. Other L in there, sorry, hard to, hard to write on the screen. And then the last one, spiral or sporili is the term we use for spiral shaped organisms. So we're gonna take a look at uh, all of these under a microscope, I'll take some pictures for you. Uh, sometimes we use arrangements uh, to describe bacteria. So diplo, diplo means two. You can see these organisms, they kind of grow and divide and they stay stuck together in batches of two. Uh, we talked about staphylo, so remember staphylo means a cluster, so if I have a staphylococcus, I've got a cluster of cells, so it might look something like that, like a bunch of grapes. And we also have strepto, so if you may have heard of strep throat, strep throat is caused by a streptococcus, so it's a coccus as well, it's round, and they form these chains. So there's actually a number of streptococcus organisms out there that cause disease in humans. So the one that causes uh, strep throat, uh, usually, usually the one that causes strep throat is called streptococcus pyogenes. Um, there's one that causes pneumonia, it's called streptococcus pneumonia. So there's a, there's a bunch of these streptococcus organisms known for uh, human diseases. So know these ones, by the way. You'll get a chance to use these words uh, in uh, next Thursday's lab. And, uh, and you'll need to know them for the lab exam as well. Uh, don't think that rods and cocci are the only shapes. There are many, many shapes of uh, bacteria out there. And this is you know, just a, a guy who wrote a paper about bacterial shapes. And you can see he's, he's showing a whole bunch of the different ones. If you look carefully, uh, well, there's the rod, it looks like G, and there's probably a, probably a cocci in there somewhere. I just don't see it. But, Anyway, lots of different shapes. So what else to, can we say about, about bacteria? Uh, we, we could say a lot about bacteria. Uh, I used to teach a whole class on them uh, and people have entire degrees in bacteriology, for example, but uh, we're, we're gonna keep this minimal. One is that they have a huge amount of metabolic diversity. So what does that mean? It means they can eat all sorts of weird things. Uh, not every bacterium, but there are species that do all sorts of weird things. So you can see the first thing, organic material. So, you know, they're kind of, some of them are like us, they eat glucose or amino acids or alcohols. Uh, there are others that uh, can utilize um, inorganic molecules uh, or some that are um, photosynthetic like plants, so they can use light. And so I want to introduce a, uh, some terminology to you. I call this troph terminology. Troph, by the way, means feeding or eating. 
So for example, you may, may have heard of these, these terms here, right? So here's an example, chemoheterotroph. So troph means eating, hetero means other, and chemo means chemicals. So humans, for example, are chemoheterotrophs. What, what does that mean? It means we eat stuff. We eat chemicals, right? So if you think about the muffin you ate for breakfast, that's made out of chemicals, right? Um, what, compared to like, for example, plants that don't eat things for their food, they make their own food, right? So um, you can see the other, other option there is photo, right? Hetero means we eat, uh, we eat molecules made by others. So humans are omnivores. So we eat plants and we eat uh, other animals. Um, we're not making our own food, but somebody else is making our food. So if you take a look at this troph terminology, there's a bunch of different terms here, right? So here's the chemo autotroph, right? So that includes humans and many bacteria, uh, such as E. coli is a chemo, no, sorry, chemo heterotroph is down here. That says chemo autotroph. Sorry about that. Uh, so things like E. coli, uh, fungi, animals, uh, we're all chemoheterotrophs. That means we eat things. Uh, some bacteria are photoautotrophs. So that inc also includes plants and algae. So, so photo means light and auto means self. So they're self-feeding and they're getting their energy from light. So that means they're photosynthetic is really what it means. But notice these other categories. Uh, Bacteria have other things they do. Some of them are chemoautotrophs. Some of them are photoheterotrophs. What, what does this mean? Um, this means they can do some weird things. You can see, for example, if you look at the chemoautotroph. So chemoautotrophs uh, use some weird chemicals. And rather than uh, using chemicals that are made by other organisms, they're using like iron to get energy and make their own food. So there's a really interesting article a couple of years ago I was reading about uh, the Titanic. And uh, you probably know people go down under the ocean and they want to look at the Titanic because it's such an interesting historical story. And it seems to be rusting way faster than they had anticipated. And they actually discovered a new species of bacteria. It lives off of rust. So rather than taking energy from the sun to make its food, it's taking energy from the Titanic to make food. And so there's lots of weird things that, that bacteria can do. And so you hear about bacteria that can eat oil from oil spills and things like that. Don't be surprised. They can do lots of weird and wonderful things. Another thing uh, we're gonna talk about later on in the semester is respiration. And so we're gonna come back to these terms here. You can see I have this terminology. It says something about a terminal electron acceptor. Uh, so what does that mean? It means what, what do they use to transfer electrons to in respiration? Uh, and uh, not everyone uses the same thing. Uh, many of us are obligate aerobes. So what does that mean? It means we must have oxygen. So that includes us as humans. And uh, bacteria have many organisms that are obligate aerobes as well. Um, some of them are obligate anaerobes. Some of them are, uh, and some may use anaerobic respiration some maybe facultative anaerobes. Uh, don't worry too much about this slide. We're gonna talk more about it when we talk about respiration. I just wanted to throw it out there that bacteria can be very diverse. Uh, one more thing about the diversity of bacteria is that we actually make use of this uh, in our food industry and, and other industries. And you can see this is showing a little graph that's saying that uh, Bacteria make many products, uh, you know, through a process called fermentation. So uh, this is not a bacterium, this is yeast, but the most commonly used fermentation product, of course, is ethanol and uh, for alcoholic beverages or uh, carbon dioxide that is used when we bake bread or pizza dough or something like that. But take a look at all these other products that are made by bacteria. A huge amount of diversity with lactic acid, so that's in like um, yogurt, uh, propionoic acid, acetic acid, acetic acid, vinegar, um, you know, we've got acetone here, so that's like nail polish remover, uh, and a huge, huge list of, of interesting things that we find in food and other products. Okay, so um, I want to talk a little bit about some select bacteria, mostly E. coli uh, is the one that I mostly want to talk about as kind of, uh, you know, a very important organism for research and, and other things. 
but there are many types out there. And you can see this is a slide talking about uh, some selected major groups of bacteria. This is actually the uh, proteobacteria. This is uh, one of the larger groups of, of, of uh, bacteria out there. These are all um, gram negatives. I think, uh, where is E. coli? I don't even show E. coli on there. E. coli, I believe, is a beta proteobacteria. I'm not 100% sure about that without looking now. Uh, but uh, like I said, we do want to talk about E. coli a little bit. Uh, here's a few others. These are all not gram negatives. Uh, so you can see we have the chlamydias, that's a sexually transmitted disease. We have the spirochetes, we have the cyanobacteria, those are photosynthetic. We've got the gram positives there, such as staphylococcus, and then something called mycoplasmas, which are really weird things that don't even have cell walls. Okay, so let's talk about E. coli, okay? Uh, I have... Um, a couple of years ago, I actually gave a talk on E. coli to try to convince the world that, of course, you know, E. coli is our friend. It's not, it's mostly harmless anyway. Uh, it lives in your gut. Uh, it has flagellas. And, uh, you know, it's mostly a mutualistic relationship between E. coli and us. Uh, there are a few strains out there that are known for causing different types of human disease. So this one in particular here, 0157, is one of the nasty ones. And if you Google... E. coli and look at about it in the news. This is the one they're usually talking about, but it's not the most common one that humans encounter. The common one that humans encounter are not causing this disease at all. This one is actually found in uh, uh, cow manure uh, and is the one that sometimes makes people sick from undercooked uh, hamburgers, for example. So this is what people usually think of when they think of E. coli. This is what I'm hoping that people will think of when they think of E. coli, thinking that, hey, E. coli is our friend. And like any friend, sometimes they do things you don't like. Um, but for the most part, we're talking about um, something that's mutualistic. So E. coli lives in your intestine. I mentioned that before. Uh, we have uh, at least a couple kilograms of bacteria in our intestine. Uh, bigger people probably have a little bit more. And of course, depending on the last time you had a bowel movement, uh, e. coli is actually just a tiny fraction of that population. Uh, so why do we talk about E. coli so much? Because it grows so well in the lab. Uh, it's very easy to grow uh, and so it makes it very easy to study. And so it's, a, like I said, a popular organism for scientists to look at because it, uh, it, it grows so well and easy to obtain. You know, people are looking at that and they're doing the math, right? Okay, you know, two to four kilograms of bacteria, um, We've got about a million E. coli uh, per gram, and you're wondering how many E. coli you have, or if you're really thinking big, maybe you're wondering how many E. coli there are on the planet or how many E. coli are ejected from human bodies on a daily basis. Many, 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 uh, huge, huge number. Uh, uh, it's found everywhere in the environment. So if you go swimming and somebody's complaining there's E. coli in the water, of course there is. E. coli is found everywhere. It's, you know, you, you can imagine, you've got birds, you've got, uh, you've got moose, you've got bears, squirrels, everybody is, is defecating, and uh, E. coli is found everywhere. It's nothing to be ashamed of or, or grossed out by. It's perfectly natural, of course, unless there's lots of it. <laughs> uh, so what else can we say about E. coli? Uh, like I said, there's many different uh, strains out there. And this is, um, uh, this is the group that uh, includes most of E. coli. Most of E. coli is non-pathogenic. You can see there's uh, some names that geneticists like to give these things, all these codes, you know, DH5-alpha, K12, so on. These ones here in particular are lab laboratory strains. Uh, some of them are pathogenic. So I mentioned the 0157. Uh, sometimes people get traveler's diarrhea when they go to Mexico or other, other uh, developing nations, and, uh, and those are, are pathogenic E. coli. Uh, like I said, they're not normally um, the ones that inhabit you, but there are pathogenic ones out there, some of them causing diarrhea, traveler's diarrhea. The 0157 is a lot worse. It can actually cause a bloody diarrhea and can be uh, you know, um, fatal in some cases. And then there's a bunch that fall into this third category, we'll call them potentially pathogenic, meaning they don't usually cause disease, but if they get into the wrong place, uh, they might cause something like a bladder infection. And so that happens sometimes. People get E. coli into their urethra, into their bladder, and, and then that's a bladder infection. So E. coli is not normally found there, so it's causing discomfort uh, and hopefully nothing worse. 
Uh, e. coli is used all the time, like I said, in labs, uh, biotechnology. I wanted to share this one uh, type of biotechnology with you, how E. coli is used in genetic engineering. Uh, and this actually was done way back in 1982. This is one of the first projects for genetic engineering that was done and uh, came up with a useful commercial project, uh, product. And this is the uh, production of human insulin in E. coli. So before 1982, if you were a diabetic and you needed insulin, where did it come from? It actually came from animals. Uh, I think it was sheep, I'm not entirely sure without looking it up, but they had to slaughter an animal and basically squeeze the insulin out of its pancreas. Um, so obviously the sheep didn't like that, and for humans, it's not quite human insulin, right? So sometimes people would end up with side effects and, and reactions to it. So 1980s, we're starting to get to the point where we're starting to understand what's going on here, and people are like, well, why don't we just make insulin in E. coli? So why not? How does that work? Well, you extract the gene for insulin from a human cell, and you can put it into a bacterial plasmid. So remember those plasmids we were talking about uh, that... Uh, uh, sometimes bacteria are sharing back and forth, but we can use them for good. So you take a plasmid, uh, do a little bit of uh, genetic engineering, you make what's called recombinant DNA, and now you have a human insulin gene in a plasmid. You can put that back into E. coli, and you put E. coli in a fermentation tank, and then E. coli uses its ribosomes to make insulin. And so now we have human insulin. It's way cheaper, way safer uh, for diabetics. And uh, there's a few brands out there. You can see this one is called Humulin. And so actually a whole bunch of products have been made in E. coli over the years. Uh, some of them useful, some of them just interesting, right? Like, for example, a couple of years ago, I was reading about a case where people were, uh, they had cloned um, mammoth. So mammoth, like the woolly mammoth, they, they, we have the genome, and they had cloned mammoth hemoglobin. So they were making mammoth hemoglobin to try to, you know, learn something about mammoths. I don't really know what it was about, but it was cool. It caught my attention. Holy mammoths. Wow. <laughs> so as I mentioned, uh, a lot of bacteria are pathogens. Uh, so I've kind of been talking about a little bit here and there. Uh, we did talk about anthrax uh, and something like 80 to 85% of human pathogens are actually bacterial. So anthrax is one of the ones we talked about. You can see there's anthrax. Most people who get anthrax are dealing with animals or the soil and they get a skin infection. Uh, I did mention the endospores. Uh, you know, if you get an anth anthrax skin infection, you, it can be treated by antibiotics. If you get an inhalation anthrax, uh, that can be uh, a lot more dangerous because it's in your lungs and it's a lot harder to treat. Uh, thankfully, most people, this is the kind of anthrax they're getting. Uh, and it's not, uh, not that common unless you're dealing a little bit more with animals. Uh, here's a, a lungs of somebody who has inhalation anthrax. Like I said, dealing with your lungs, that's a bit more of a dangerous uh, situation. And there are a lot of animals that die from anthrax annually, particularly animals that are digging around in the soil. And so if this is a place where uh, other animals have died of anthrax and, and then the endospores end up in the soil, uh, they dig it up while they're eating and, and uh, they can inhale it. So like I said, a huge number of diseases. I'm, I'm not gonna, I can't really obviously go through all of them, but here's a list of some. You may have heard of them. Maybe you've had one or two of these. Hopefully no one here has had the flesh-eating disease. Um, but, uh, you know, um, many of them are, are treatable by antibiotics, and I do want to talk about antibiotics for a couple of minutes before we finish up today. Um, so one thing to say about antibiotics is that some bacteria out there are what we call superbugs. So what do I mean by superbug? It means it is resistant to multiple drugs. Uh, so this is, this is something that we're concerned about medically, obviously, uh, these superbugs that are very hard to treat. The number one superbug out there is one that we've talked about already. There is our friend Staphylococcus aureus. So the superbug actually has a full name. You can see the full name is methicillin-resistant or multiple drug-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So MRSA, sometimes people call it MRSA, kind of, I don't know, doesn't work for me, but uh, MRSA is, uh, is something we're very concerned about in hospitals. And if you ever, ever go to a hospital, next time take a look around and once in a while you'll see a door 
And uh, it won't necessarily say MRSA on it, but it might say that this patient is being isolated due to an infection because uh, they're worried about this infection being spread to other people in the hospital. So um, most people who get MRSA uh, out in the community, it, it's a skin infection. So you might get some pimples or, or kind of a, you know, a little bit of a, a rash or something like that. And, and if it's MRSA, it may be hard to treat. It may last for a while and you may go through several drugs of treatment. Uh, if you're in the hospital, way more serious. As you can imagine, in a hospital, people are getting potentially invasive procedures. They may be getting catheters or surgery and getting MRSA introduced to your blood uh, can actually be fatal. So it's a very big concern in hospitals. There's a picture I found of uh, just saying, hey, clean your hands. So just a reminder, wash your hands, particularly in the hospital. Okay, so I want to talk about antibiotics. Let me see where we are with time. I think we have enough time to kind of talk about that. So here's the structures we've been talking about, right? And uh, so why do I have this column here? You know, this is just my brain trying to organize these things and think about these things. You know, what are they? What are they made of? So part of that for me anyway, is thinking about what they're made of, such as the cell wall being made of peptidoglycan. Plus this is important information for you to know for the midterm. Uh, I think we are maybe two weeks away from the midterm. I can't quite remember the exact date, but uh, we're gonna finish topic six first and do some reviews. So my plan is uh, next Friday to do a little bit of review. But uh, just a reminder, if you're thinking about the midterm, you can always get started on it to start studied on, studying on it anyway, anytime. So most of these things have some sort of clinical re relevance. And what do I mean by that? It, mean, it means it helps them establish infections like the, or attach to things, right? So the glycocalyx, um, about it, strep throat can't attach to your throat uh, and can't evade your immune system. A number of these other things are actually drug targets, uh, which is what I want to talk about now for a couple of minutes. So there's a whole bunch of things about bacterial cells that are different than human cells, right? So think about this. A bacterial cell has a cell wall. Our cells do not. So it turns out that uh, that's a vulnerability, meaning that that's something in the bacteria that is different from us and so we can target it. And if we, have, uh, if we have chemicals that will disrupt something to do with the bacterial cell wall, then it will kill the bacteria and probably not have much of a side effect in humans. Uh, there's a bunch of bacterial drug targets you can see. There's differences in protein synthesis and uh, membrane structure and DNA replication. But I just wanna focus on the cell wall synthesis here. And in particular, I wanna focus in on the penicillins. So like I said, we're just gonna focus on number A here, penicillins. So how do penicillins work? Um, there's our little cell. You can see it's got a cell wall. And they kind of stretch out. And as they stretch out, uh, it's kind of like any renovation. Sometimes you gotta take out some of the drywall before you put some new stuff in. Uh, same thing with the bacteria. As they stretch out, they make spaces for the new material and then they fill it in. So here goes my new peptidoglycan and then it's gonna divide. So penicillin is kind of, it gets to this space and these spaces are made and then penicillin gets in there and it's kind of like throwing a, whole, a monkey wrench into the whole machinery and all these holes and the whole thing just kind of bursts open. So hope you enjoyed my cute little animation there. Uh, so here's penicillin here. Uh, we've got a, a bunch of different drugs that fall under the group penicillins. This here, penicillin G is the original one that was, uh, that was discovered. You can see they have different uses. Some of them are effective against certain bacteria, not others. Uh, some of them, like penicillin B here, you can see it's acid resistant. So that's important because uh, that way you can take it as a drug um, orally through your mouth and it can survive the digestive processes. Uh, so there's a whole bunch out there. Uh, sometimes they're also called beta-lactams. That's sort of the chemist's name for that uh, little square structure you can see that's labeled, uh, that's, that's all there in yellow. Okay, so that's actually the end of this topic on bacteria. Uh, I have this last slide to share with you. Uh, and uh, you're probably looking at that and thinking, oh, that's just a, that's a wonderful E. coli. You can see the plasmids in there and or ribosomes or whatever those are supposed to be, lots of pili and all that. I'll tell you what that is, that's my sister-in-law. <laughs> so my sister-in-law is also a microbiologist and uh, 
one year, uh, her and her, her husband, uh, they decided uh, they were going to buy a bunch of uh, glow sticks. And uh, my brother-in-law actually, um, he made himself this uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex. It was really a, a piece of art with all the tape and glow sticks he used. And, and she made equal life. So if you're looking for an idea for Halloween this year and you want something that no one else is doing and is super cool, then hey, pick E. coli. Okay, so that's the end of today's lecture. Uh, I hope you have a wonderful weekend. I know things are getting a little bit busy, uh, so I do encourage you to work a little bit on Biology 107, at least look at the lab report and maybe think about uh, how, you know, any studying strategies. Uh, we are gonna talk a little bit about that next week. Um, but I encourage you to take a look at, uh, at what you have so far and, uh, and maybe uh, you'll get a chance to uh, you know, ask some questions next week. I see one person has a question and it says inhibit means blocking. Uh, yeah, blocking or stopping. I would say stopping is a little closer to blocking, but same idea. A good question. But yeah, so make sure you do take a look at your Biology 107 in the next couple of days. Like I said, lab report and midterm coming up. So. Uh, Lots of things to work on. Other than that, have a great weekend and we will see you on Monday.